This is the Get A Life Podcast. X-Cult Conversations. Hi, everyone. Cheryl back here with Get A Life Podcast, X-Cult Conversations. And we have Carmen and Richard joining today as well. We just want to put out a huge thank you to everyone that has been supporting us lately in all of the news. There's been so much happening in the PBCC world. They have given us more information to deal with than we can handle. And we are just very grateful for our spies inside. We have many insiders that work tirelessly at giving us what we are needing. And so we would really, really like just to say thank you to everybody who has been helping us out. And one more way you can help support us is by make sure that you have already subscribed to watching us. We need you to hit the subscribe button, like each video and comment if you can. I understand that if you're inside the PBCC and you don't have a anonymous or a fake account that you can't and that's okay. But if you have a fake account and if you or you're outside, Please, please, please make sure that you have subscribed to Get a Life podcast. That helps us tremendously. I also want to touch a little bit on, I know that there's, there's, there's quite a few insiders that are struggling right now with um, everything that's been happening. Hypocrisy and the lies have come to a whole new level inside there. And I want to touch just a little bit on a scary move that maybe some of you guys need to take in there. And it, you could be, there could be one person in there that needs to take a stance or talk to someone that you know is already unhappy in there. But inside there, there needs to be a place where you guys can stand up and know that you're going to be supported but to be able to say no to what is happening in there. And I know it's scary. Every single one of us know how scary it is to stand up and take a stance to something that is not right. The podcast we're about today to do today really got me in my feels this morning. And it's, it's just, it's very heart wrenching. It's very heart wrenching on how Bruce has the power in there to not only rewrite history, But to take the lives of young kids away, and I'm talking about people in there who are affected by the rewriting of history, the little kids that are affected by pedophilia, the teenagers that are affected by the pursuing and the pushing of the alcohol. And if you were to sit back, I just sat back this morning and looked at the big picture of everything and really, really realized that even though we're doing our work out here, that it is going to come a time when somebody gets brave enough to stand up and say no inside there. And I guarantee you that there's going to be more than one of you, but somebody has to stand up and say no. And I know it's scary. You're going to think you're losing your business. You're losing your family. You're losing your connections. Stop think, what if, what if, I was the one to stand up and be like, I'm not tolerating this anymore. And you're not worrying about being kicked out. You're not worrying about all those fears that they place on you to stop doing that. Maybe you are the one to stand up and say no more. It's coming from myself. It's very hard. It is. I did not want to have to stand up and do, do what I did, but I had to put myself aside I had to put my own fears and worries aside and I had to do this for the little kids in there. So I think we're coming to a time um, where change is really, really, really happening inside there. There are a lot of moving pieces that are moving that eventually when you're feeling like you're being suffocated, that maybe that is your soul asking you to stand up and say, I can't do this anymore, and change needs to happen. Just stop and just think maybe, what if everything went okay when I did stand up and say, yes, it's going to be chaotic. Yes, it's all those things. But having a end goal of stopping the abuse, it's the abuse on every level. We're coming to abuse that is 
absolutely horrific on every level possible. And at some point, you guys in there need to stand up and say no more, even though it's scary, even though you haven't broke free of the indoctrination, but you know it's wrong. You know it's evil. So that's just my little heartfelt reminiscing this morning when I was thinking about the podcast we're about to do today. So today, Carmen's going to dive into what happened to her father, how Bruce and the PBCC are, are trying to rewrite that history and allow you guys to really see how evil the PBCC have gotten. So Carmen, I'm going to let you start off and just explain what we're about to see. Well, as as anybody that has followed us um, will remember, we've addressed this um, on a previous podcast um, because the details were hidden of what actually transpired that day. We did a full podcast on it. We explained exactly what happened. Um, and in doing the podcast that we did, we actually had all the official documents. So we knew that the story we were putting out there, not only did we have firsthand people that were there. Um, we had the certified death certificate. We had pictures of the scene. We had we had all of our decks in a row when we put that podcast out there. And it was really interesting because a couple of weeks after that podcast went out, um, an insider reached out to us and said, do you understand that inside there, they put out a documentary rebutting what you said in the podcast? which to me was shocking because the story was pretty clear. Like we knew we had all the foundations of the story. We had the registered certified death certificate. So what would be the motive of trying to rewrite a story and change it? And without imputing motives exactly, the only, I mean, there's some pretty obvious ones. Um, I think, we sat back for a little bit and thought about it and someone was gracious enough to provide us with a copy of the documentary that was put out that refuted the version of what happened the day my father was taken. Um, so we're going to show you this little clip. It's not a long clip um, and you really have to listen and the thank huge, huge thank yous to the person that alerted us this. Um, but once you listen and you start to think about it and realize how dangerous it is for a group like the PBCC to start rewriting history, you lose the value of the lessons that were learned on that day. And in trying to rewrite it, you change all the personalities. You, I personally feel like they're trying to whitewash the history of the situation which is exactly why they hid the details of it for so many years. And they're trying to make somebody look better than he is. It's not that, you know, 40 something years later that you want to point fingers or blame someone. But the fact of the matter is, if you're trying to erase or trying to rewrite what happened that day, it brings up a very obvious question. Why? So this, to sort of set this, the scene for everybody, um, to make it as crystal clear as we can. Um, we have pulled up on Google Maps the current sort of location of the meeting room. Um, it, of course, doesn't look like it did that day, but the locations of the buildings are the same and the actual highline wires are the same as they are in this picture. So the red building with the brick all along the bottom is the, the ever familiar niche uh, meeting room that for all those years, the fellowship meetings were held in. On this edge, along that yellow painted curb, all the buses used to come down from Winnipeg and they would all park, uh, par uh, not par parallel parked along this, this, the, this curb, right up against this curb. At the time of the accident, there were buses parked all along this curb in front of the meeting room. Um, as you come over, you can see some Highline wires above this building. This building used to be Symington Construction. It was a long white building, but these wires are exactly the same wires as they were back then. They're Highline wires. They carry 10,000 volts of power in them. 
we've pulled up a picture of a crane. It's not the crane that was there that day, but it is a similar crane. It's a PNH crane. Um, and it has the uh, lattice mass on it. Um, and you will notice the hook on the end of it um, up hanging off the mast. That is the kind of hook that we're referring to. That is the kind of hook that is referred to in the death certificate we're going to show you later on. Um, but that is the hook that my dad grabbed from the ground. This is a clip from the documentary put out by the PBCC. This is a clip that the PBCC have copyrighted under uh, UBT. So just acknowledging that it isn't a copyrighted clip. There, the overseas group went on to 3D meetings in Plainfield, now Westfield, then flew to Winnipeg and on to Nietzsche by bus. Just before the bus arrived in Nietzsche, Mr. Symington's third son, Kenny, was electrocuted in a tragic accident when a crane he had been repairing passed under a power line. The brethren went into the Nietzsche Hall and waited. Jay just came in and sat in his usual seat. He said, I expect the brethren all have heard. Dear Ken has been killed. On the Tuesday night. Um, but if you listen very closely to the verbiage that they used in that clip, they are inferring that my dad was driving the crane. And the initial report that was brought to us said, the brethren are trying to say your dad was driving the crane the day he was killed. And I knew there's no way he was never driving the crane. That was part of the circumstances that led up to the accident. Um, Roy was angry because the metal had not been taken off the truck. And when I say taken off the truck, they used to have uh, steel beams with this curved um, metal that would come in on a flatbed, flatbed trailer. And there wasn't enough room for those trailers to fit in front of the shop to be unloaded right there. So those trailers would park up on the road. Um, and then they would get the crane and unload the metal off the trailers and put it in the um, shed parking lot. Um, the day that the accident happened, Roy had wanted dad to go and get it unloaded because there was already buses at the meeting room and people were waiting and Roy wanted to get over to the meeting room. But dad was fixing something else and said, let me finish this first. And that made Roy mad. And he got angry, jumped up in the crane and he wasn't used to driving the crane. And he, the witnesses on the scene have told us that it jerked. Um, he was very jerky with it. He had spun it around. And as he spun it around, my dad must have seen the hook fly out and he reached up to grab the hook to prevent the hook from hitting a parked vehicle that was parked up on the road and that is what one of the eyewitnesses has told us when he grabbed that um, hook the mast on the crane swung and it hit the power line when it hit the power line the surge of power came down the mast and the only place for it to exit was through my dad. So he was killed instantly from the power that came down from the power line. And, you know, I think the, the issue that the issue with all of this is accidents happen, right? Things happen. Right. We don't we don't have an issue with what happened or the accident. It's the way that it has been covered up in order to not let the people that should be taking responsibility take responsibility. Your issue isn't with what happened. Your issue is what they're doing with the information, what they've done with the information. You cannot rewrite history and whitewash it to make you look good and not have the people that are affected by it protest against it. Exactly. It is so, so dangerous to try and rewrite a tragedy like this. This is the tragedy of, I mean, anybody in the PBCC that was in the PBCC in 1975 in the thereabouts, as soon as the name Ken Symington comes up, they're like, oh, I remember. It's like one of those moments, you know where you were when you heard about this that happened. Um, it yes. just, it shook everybody. It was a 30-year-old um, father, 
He had three children. His wife was expecting the fourth one. It's the end of July. The fourth child is due the first week of November. So she's five and a half, six months pregnant. And this horrific accident happens outside a meeting room. The buses are all lined up outside there. There's people sitting in the buses when this tragedy occurred. Now, I say all that to say, why this many years later do you want to change what happened that day? Yeah, I mean, I can confirm that because I was growing up in the UK and most brethren would have had a picture of your father on the piano or on the ministry shelves. And it was very frequently referred to in the meeting. So, yeah, it it it, it, it echoed all around the world. And it, and it was very evident right from day one that my dad was not driving the crane. I mean, that just wasn't even a, that wasn't even a consideration in anybody's mind. Hmm. So I guess I have to question, what is the PBCC motive yeah. for trying to say that, um, that my dad had been repairing the crane and then the crane passed under the power line? Now, we just showed you the pictures of the power lines, and it's very clear from the height of the crane and the positioning of the power lines, it's like an accident waiting to happen. When you look at the scene of it, there's just not even any question what happened that day. But to say that the he was repairing the crane, is their exact words, and the crane passed under the power line. It doesn't even, it, there's just, it's not even possible. Yeah. Um, and yet it feels like such a blatant attempt to rewrite the events of that day. And I guess it's not to try and hold anyone responsible. What's happened has happened. He's gone. Yeah. He's been gone. We, were, we grew up without him. But the horrific part of it is why this attempt to rewrite it at this time um, it, it feels like it's an attempt to whitewash someone else to, to take away the blame from the situation. The blame yeah. was clearly there. Grandpa never hid the blame. He said in a meeting right afterwards, he said straight to Roy Symington, he said, you killed your brother. Now, I don't, you know, it's not that, it's not that we're trying to draw attention to that. What I'm saying is, he said it like it was at the time. So why now try to rewrite history to cover that up? Unless you're trying to protect someone and make someone more important than they're supposed to be. I mean, it, it shocks me. I mean, I could understand they might want to protect Roy's reputation. And in that case, they could have just mentioned that this was the day your father died. Uh, and then moved on in the documentary. Why? Why construct a lie and insert a lie into there? Why? Why make words and phrases that run true? It's it's very, it's very disturbing. Uh, and when you talk about the damage, the, there's another kind of damage that comes out of this, and that is, and I think this is actually a quote. This is actually a quote from JT, I believe, and. Um, someone, I think, had lied to JT and then went and apologized to him for having lied to him. And JT said to him, well, I accept your apology. I forgive you, but I may never trust you again. So this, mm -hmm. is, the damage that, this is the damage that lies do. They damage the liar. And, and when you've been lied to now by the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, the organization the publishers, the people who publish the ministry, the people who run the UBT, the people that give you all these videos, when they're lying to you, it, it leaves the question, what else are they lying about? Now, that's the damage. Yeah. And I think this is what the insiders are struggling with right now, right? Because the lies are becoming more like just blatant. I mean, we're seeing that in the spokesperson, the rebuttals to things. Like the lies are just so black and white right now that you know they're a lie. And they're so prominently a lie that 
some of them are believing the lies when they know there are lies and then those lies become truth. But then there's all these other people that are seeing through the lies that are happening right now. And it's hard for them. It's a hard reality to chew on when you know you're inside this evil organization and you are literally witnessing night after night after night blatant lies that you're seeing not only from news report they've done but inside the church services um prayers that are happening all these things that are happening and now it's just you're you're sitting there in a field of lies and what do you do with it they that, that's what they're really struggling with is this complete controversial part of the pbcc that's coming out right now instead if you just sit back if bruce would just sit back and be like Look at the big picture because they keep digging themselves in these holes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper when we can pull apart everything that they're saying and have proof of them lying. It's just going to create the split in there. He literally, these lies are what are going to create the next split inside the PBCC. Yeah. yeah. And when we receive this, um, this, you know, the, the actual cup or the recording of the documentary, um, my mom wanted to see it and it really really upset her to think yeah this many years later they got rid of her back in 1990 um and 1991 and you don't even I, she will not even go into the details of what all transpired transpired during that time period it is so hurtful um but when she heard this she was like why 40 something years later are they lying and trying to recreate a na narrative around a story so we went back we we actually went as far as to go back and repurchase the certified copy of the death certificate so we now have in our possession a working copy of the death certificate that we received from the funeral home working file we received the initial copy that was filed with the state of North Dakota. And then we paid for, and this is not expensive, Symington Brothers. If you're going to put out a documentary, you might ought to look at the legal death certificate and check it before you put out a documentary lying. So we are going to show you the actual legal copy of the death certificate. And this is a certified copy. You will notice uh, about halfway down, you'll see under the section that says cause and you go all the way over. It happened at 6, 10 p.m. at night. It says how the injury occurred. He was holding the crane cable when it hit the electric line. No doubts there. It doesn't leave. There is no ambiguity in that statement. Yeah, it doesn't say he was he driving was it. not repairing a crane. He was not inside the crane. He was not driving the crane. He was on the ground. And he reached up and grabbed the hook. There's just no denying it. And I think we have a close-up mm -hmm. um, to get even closer just to make sure. We don't want to offer anything that's blurred or not crystal clear. You'll look on 20C, on line 20C, it happened at 6.10 p.m. And 20D, it says he was holding the crane cable that hit the electric line. Nothing ambiguous. He was not repairing a crane. And for the Symington brothers to be on a documentary reading the transcript that has altered or rewritten history, shame on them. They could have driven to Cavalier, North Dakota, spent $5 and got a copy of this death certificate and verified. And instead, they're content to put their voices on a documentary trying to rewrite history. Yeah. Very distressing. Very distressing. Yeah. Um, in fact, it distressed my mom enough that she wrote down um, her memory of the details of that day. All right. My name is Marion Symington Gilmore. I don't comment on any of these sites much, but after reading the article put out by the PBCC on my husband Ken's death, I can no longer stay silent. I must put the errors in this documentary out there. On July 29th, 1975, my father-in-law, James H. Symington, and his wife came to my door 
I had a house full of company and was waiting to serve supper. But Ken had not come home yet. When my father-in-law and mother-in-law came to my door, he said there had been an accident and Ken was dead. I said, where is he? And asked to go to the site. And he drove me to Roy's shed. At the shed, there were many of Roy's workers, many of the townspeople, and some of the busloads of brethren who had arrived for the meeting. It was devastating to see the P&H parked on the side of the driveway of the shed. Kenny was laying on the ground on his back, and my initial reaction was to question Roy if he wasn't still living as his eyes were still slightly open. On the way back, I questioned my father-in-law as to what happened, and he told me Roy had asked Ken to move the P&H, but Kenny was just finishing up another job. So Roy was angry and jumped into the machine and was going to move it himself. Those standing close by saw the boom of the P&H start to swing and at least one other worker and Kenny headed over to stop the swinging cable because the boom was so close to the high line, the high power line. Kenny got there first, grabbed the hook and took the shock which went into his neck and came out through his foot. Kenny was not repairing the crane that day. He just saw what was happening and moved to stop the inevitable outcome. There was a doctor at the shed already when I got there, but as far as a law enforcement report, they were not called. I have wondered about that over the years, as that would be normal in a case like this one. There is a death certificate signed by a doctor who is no longer alive, but it collaborates the story I was told. Some of this information came from my father-in-law, some from the workers, and others came to tell me in the days following. The shock made me less careful of my words, and I told Ken's father on the way home that Ken had stayed home from meeting on Monday night as he was exhausted and told him how we had discussed how things were going, and Ken had stated, what we are doing is not right, working the long hours and setting aside the meetings and the family time. Also, Kenny said, something is going to happen. We had never thought it would so closely affect us. He, my father-in-law, later told me the same truth about what happened in the same words when they invited us over to their house for a meal. They said the power from the line arced to the boom, but others say the boom touched the line. Why would Kenny's brothers change the true story at this late date, 48 years later? Is it to leave a better memory of Roy? July 29th is a date that has caused a lot of misery for, for us all these years. To say nothing of the fact that I was left to raise three children. The oldest was four years old and one not yet born. So I guess as I read this letter from my mom, um, what I want to relay to everybody is the PBCC trying to rewrite history not only affects all the people inside there that they've they're putting out this documentary that that their members have to purchase the right to view this and to purchase the right to view this one hour and 23 minute documentary cost a member $422 US dollars to watch this documentary. And, and I find it shocking. I find it, it's horrifying to think to cover up a podcast to attempt to whitewash history, to attempt to make people look better or to, to, to transfer blame. They would be willing to record a documentary and sell it to their members at 422 US dollars a pop. They should be ashamed of themselves. You know, I went and was researching um, the bite model again. And I mean, we're always, we know they're a cult. What I want inside there is for people to realize what they're inside, right? It's, this is not even a high demand religious group anymore. We are a full blown cult. And I want to share something with you that is on, that ticks off because we, I mean, yes, we've talked about Aberdeen, right? We've talked about how Aberdeen has been rewritten. I mean, we'll, we'll share some, uh, some scripture quotes of that after, but I want to see if I could find through through Steve Hassan's bite model if this was on there 
So let me just share this with you. So it's under the I, information control. <laughs> Deception, which we know the PBCC are, that literally is their number one tactic right now. It's just lies, 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 deceive, deceive, deceive. Deception, 1A, deliberately withhold information, which we know they do. B, distort information to make it more acceptable. Literally right there. And that is what is happening here. We're having information distorted 45 years later to make things more acceptable in the eyes of those that are still in there. I guess my 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 hurt from this is that I don't think the PBCC know how dangerous it is to rewrite history. It is one of the most dangerous things that you can ever do inside a community like what they're doing. Bruce Hales is digging his own grave. He literally is digging his own grave, not only just with this, but the amount of deception that is happening inside there. People are going to start seeing through it. People are seeing through it. Yeah. And I think the important, um, when you think of the um, the aftermath of this tragedy um, and thinking, if, if you've gone back through the ministry, I know because I was sitting there and I don't remember it being said, but of course, as soon as I got old enough to be able to read about stuff that happened at that time, I remember going back and reading all these meetings, just trying to seek an understanding of what had happened. And then what? how did grandpa talk about it like how did he address it in the meeting and if you look at the years afterwards he spent an incredible amount of time going over in detail the priorities of a simple christian the priorities of not getting caught up in your business not um being at your business unloading a truck full of steel when brethren are waiting at the meeting room it's about getting your priorities straight it's about learning to manage your time. It's about putting the things that are supposed to be the most important first. And then when the tragedy happened, he spent so much time um, ensuring that people learned the lesson from it. He he had he so hoped that the people that were responsible would learn the lesson. You know that very story that she said that dad had stayed home the night before. And he had gone over they were working nights instead of c even bothering to come into meeting um they would stay out in the field and and choose to stay out and do their farming and when this happened grandpa brought so much focus on you know if you're going to be a mainstream christian church act like a mainstream christian yeah um commit yourself to it act like a christian take care of the young people and in this case he laid responsibility on some of these guys to grow up you know own up to your mistakes own the responsibility for them and as you accept it it will change you and you will become a better person for it and i think that that's such an important lesson no matter what happens to us in life it's not that we're trying to go back and say anybody was bad or anybody was no. or whatever yeah. anything bad that happens in life the number one goal is how are we going to come out the other side? And when you come out the other side, you should come out with a refreshed commitment not to do these things again. You can go back and change the story to make it look better. It was what it was. And grandpa didn't, he, a lot of it, he didn't shy away from. He was pretty blunt in the meetings afterwards. Um, you, you can look them up. He said, you killed your brother. Now, yeah, that's a we'll share that clip. Thing. We'll we'll share that. That's a shocking thing for a man to say about his own two sons in in a church, and yet he felt like it was so important. He said it so that everybody else around could learn from it, and he referred to it for the rest of his ministry. If you look in the subject index, the category around his son Kenny's death is huge because he wanted people to not repeat it. The ministry quote is, he's done that too, you know. He did it in our place. He took one of the best young men we had to teach us something, to teach me something. 
I knew that what was going on wasn't up to the standard. I knew that. And I thought, well, it'll work itself out. Time will change it. Time didn't change it. It reached a point. Who did the Lord mean more than anybody else? Me. Can you follow that? And my son, his brother, and all kinds of things happened. You killed your brother. If you go out and put out a documentary and whitewash the details, change the details of the day, where do the lessons go? Where is, where is what was supposed to be learned on that day? It becomes just a waste. If you want to change what happened that day, are you trying to take away the lessons that are that that were meant to be learned in that day? It's shocking. And do you think Bruce is really trying to clean up any remnants that could be that could tarnish the look of the PBCC? Like that's what I think he's doing. Is he's we've got a new generation in now, right? That don't know about Aberdeen that wouldn't know all the details about Kenny's death. And here's a perfect opportunity to present a completely new narrative that could come up in conversation. It's the perfect. Well, I, I think, I think that is, that must be one of the motives. I mean, one thing that's very noticeable about Bruce Hales is he spends an awful lot of time trying to whitewash Hale's history, which we know is very, there's a lot of ruts in the roads of Hale's history. And he spent an enormous amount of time retelling and rewriting the whole narrative about the commercial system, about WBH. Um, and yeah, this is, this is part of the same process. Yeah. And I mean, we see that now, even in the whole, situation with the alcohol inside the pbcc and we, let's refer it to the rory tifal uh, accident you know we've heard that rory's been withdrawn from right and yet they're still funding his his court case but is that really what rory needs right now does rory is rory needing being to be isolated from the whole community that he knows or do you think maybe what this what this generation needs is their own man of God to own up about the alcohol problem and start some sort of change inside there to help them? It's not you don't you don't I mean, yes, what he was doing wasn't right. I mean, what was he he was driving at? What was he clocked at the highest was two hundred and thirty six kilometers an hour or something like that? Edit to this that it was two hundred and twenty three kilometers an hour, not two hundred and thirty six. I don't know, it was outrageous. Um, but the thing is, is this is another example of where it's this constant covering up, covering up, covering up. It's the pedophilia. I think that's where my heart really is right now is about all those little kids in there, teenagers, adults that have all been sexually abused in some way and they have no door to go to that says, I need to get this off my chest. I want healing from this. The you need healing from it. You can't just have this constantly whitewashed, um, put it underneath the covers so that nobody looks at it. Like this is going to be the downfall of them. It really is going to be the downfall of them. And this JHS documentary is the biggest light bulb moment that any of you guys inside there can have. If they are willing to cover up this big of a detail, don't you think everything that we're saying is true? All these survivors that have been on here. I mean, talking about Rory Tiefel, when that accident just happened, they, in their frank news, they changed the, the news report. They took a news report from a, from a newspaper and changed it to make it look as if it wasn't anything to do with the Brethren and then published it in what they call Frank News to try and make out to the brethren that there was, you know, no brethren at fault. I mean, when you read the report they'd altered, it made it look as if it was some woman driving dangerously that had caused the accident. So again, it's another case of them trying to change the, trying to change the narrative around something that there was lessons to be learned from. And it seems that now, in that case, they've failed to change the narrative. So they then try and distance themselves from 
the poor guy who was at fault in the accident, whereas we know that ultimately this is a result of the PBCC fast cars and drinking culture, which is promoted by Bruce Hales. Yeah. And in bringing up the Rory Tiefel story, um, this is a young man that, you know, is, is very messed up and he's been very influenced by this alcoholic culture. Mm -hmm. And it's not to um, draw attention to his mistakes because every young person as they grow up and mature makes mistakes. We understand all that. We're very empathetic with that. But at this point, um, there has been young lives. In this particular accident, there's two young people that lost their lives. And it is time for some of the adults inside the PBCC, instead of withdrawing from a young man that made a mistake it's time for some leaders to stand up and say you know what this has gotten into our culture and it's unacceptable people are dying people are suffering families are being broken up you know when you get a family that has lost a young a a, a son think of the mother think of the father they've lost a child um and and the siblings it it it's a family that is broken and it never heals and it never gets better. So why can't some adults, some leaders, some shepherds stand up and say, we're not going to tolerate the abuse of alcohol inside our mainstream Christian church. So there's some background to this epidemic of lies that's kind of overcome the PBCC in the last 20 years. And I say the last 20 years because this is very much a feature of Bruce Hale's administration. Certainly when we were growing up in the Symington administration, in the John Hales administration, lying was, it, it, it was a direct path to hell. I mean, we were told, and I, we've, we've said this before, liars go to hell. That would be the response if you were caught telling a lie. But since Bruce Hales has taken over, he's legitimized lying. And, and here's a quotation actually from his printed ministry. Um, it's a bit of an oblique reference. It's a, it's a scriptural reference, but he's twisting this scripture to make out that, in fact, yes, it's okay to tell lies. So this is what he's saying. She gave them a false, false lead. That's good. She leaked some very, very valuable information that was completely untrue. She sent them forth. She would fit into this idea of the secret service, which is a very essential part, really, of the way the recovery has been sustained. And he said this in Melbourne on um, the 11th of February, 2012. Now, what he's really saying here, and, and to people who haven't been in the, in the Brethren, this is, is kind of inside language, He's referring to the Secret Service, and in the Brethren they talk about the Secret Service, which is by an analogy with the kind of the spy network and MI5, MI6, and James Bond and so on. The Brethren like to think that they have some kind of equivalent Secret Service, which really means it's, it's a kind of a code word for saying doing things that are a little bit illegal or a little bit off, but it's okay because you're doing it for the sake of the testimony or for the sake of the brethren. It kind of says that, well, if you're doing something that's for the benefit of the brethren, um, you know, it's, um, it's the ends that count and, you know, you can be a little bit sketchy about what means you use. So that's what he's saying here. And he's saying this is an essential part of the way the recovery has been sustained, where the recovery, by the recovery, they're referring to the history of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church from J.N. Darby in 1830 right through to the present day. They refer to that as the recovery. Ironically, the full term is the recovery of the truth. Um, so what he's really saying here, that the recovery of the truth as they like to call themselves, has been sustained on by a background of lies. And and this is the and this has been indoctrinated and fed into the minds of all Bruce's followers over a period of twenty years, which is why they're all so good at lying, and why they lie without hesitation. And it's 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 morally 
utterly inexcusable. I mean, it's completely and utterly wrong. It's completely unchristian. It's completely immoral. Uh, but by a process of gradually infiltrating this idea and, and connecting it to misplaced passages of scripture, Bruce has actually raised these people to, to lie on demand. And they're good at it. <laughs> they're very good at it. I yeah. mean, when we're into talking about current situations right now, the desecration of the graves is horrific what is happening there. And how just recently the spokesperson came back with they're taking what is it? What was the word they used? Meticulous. They care. are they, so just to just to give the background here, this is a uh, the brethren in, in the UK in, in New Newtown, which is a, a little town in Wales, bought an old an old chapel um, in one of the outlying hamlets to use as a subdivisional room. And it had a, had a graveyard with maybe 50, 50, 60 graves in it. And they wanted to use the graveyard as a parking lot for all their big SUVs. Um, so they apply for planning permission to convert some of the land around the chapel to a parking lot. And it needed an access road through the graveyard. And there was one corner of the graveyard that wasn't actually used, didn't have any graves in it. So they submitted a plan which showed a narrow 10 foot wide access road, just clipping that corner of the graveyard and then round to their main parking lot at the back of the chapel. The plan was passed by the council. Um, you know, it wasn't anything dramatic, no reason why it shouldn't have been. And then when they actually constructed their parking lot, they, they made the road 19 feet wide, and instead of curving to the right to miss the graveyard, they also spread it, extended it to the left by 40 feet, which covered several of the graves, and they, they moved the headstones. And, of course, the locals were outraged. There were people turned up with flowers to put on the grandparents' grave, and where the grave used to be, there's just gravel rolled down. Anyway, of course, this all blows up, um, a lot of local people got very upset. But the, the shocking thing is, almost more shocking than what they did, is that the, the spokesman for the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church says, we have adhered meticulously yeah. to the planning permission that was granted. <laughs> and then you go and watch the video. I watched the video this morning of the drone footage, and I was like, I, like, I like I say I was in my fields this morning. It's just this is just heart wrenching at how abhorrent, um, their lack of respect for humanity outside themselves. They truly, truly believe they are the only freaking humans on this planet, and they get to do whatever they want to do, and they will do whatever they want to do, say whatever they want to say in order to clean up their past. And be able to do and show that there's there's this shiny ball of sparkly light to everybody, which is completely false. I know we've kind of gotten off track here from what we were talking about, but we're getting back to their spokesperson and how they lie. They just lie. There's my oldest sister told me that 99% of what I hear is lies. And what I want to tell back to her is no, honey, 99% of what you hear is lies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to find a lie, just Google PBCC spokesperson, and immediately after that, you will find a lie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have um, gone down several rabbit holes with with lies and, and whitewashing and brainwashing and whatever. Also on this documentary, we found the neatest little clip that I think that there have been so many people that remember my grandpa so well. And um, when I heard this clip and it's his voice actually telling this story, it kind of jars you back to that moment. Um, he, he had just a funny way of telling a story and a, a super funny way of laughing that I had kind of forgotten. But as soon as you hear it again, it like shakes you. Um, so we thought to end this, uh, this podcast, we would play this story that is in his own voice to share it for all the people out there 
that once you are excommunicated from the PBCC, you are not allowed to hear any of their recordings, hear any of their voices. You're not supposed to have access to their ministry. And we thought it might be kind of a nice little surprise for people, just a trip down memory lane. So we hope you'll enjoy this little story. Uh, and make sure when you finish watching the podcast, make sure you subscribe and you like and leave us a comment. Tell us if you liked it or not. Okay. Until next time, much love to everyone. JHS would leave for school around 7 a.m. for the six and a half mile ride each way on his well-trained dapple gray horse called Gray Dog. He would stable his horse for the day at his uncle Roly Hughes's house and be served a noon meal there by Roly's wife, Mary. JHS later related an incident where his horse walked away from him one day while going to school and had to be disciplined. I rode that horse, not only hundreds of miles, but thousands of miles. It adds up to thousands. And one morning, this lousy bronco that I rode, and I loved him. He was a lovely horse. He weighed 1,140 pounds and run in shape, and he could run. I, <laughs> I was glad to ride with him when he ran. That's just a kind of confession. I was at that age, and everything was so... And I was going to school. <laughs> and I got off him, like I usually did, and dropped the reins on the ground. He was neck rain broke, if you know what that means. It was a Montana horse. I dropped the reins on the ground and shut the gate, as I did day after day. And that miserable, <coughs> dapple, <laughs> dapple gray walked away on me. I walked after him. What else could I do? I ran after him. When I ran, he ran. When I got out of breath, of course, I walked. And he walked. <laughs> Mile and a half. We walked all the way to town, a mile and a half. That wasn't that wasn't uh, pleasant, to say the least, because the temperature's what it is and uh, everything. But that night, while we usually went six and a half miles in thirty minutes, that was the usual that was the usual procedure. Six and a half miles in thirty minutes. We went six and a half miles in twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that horse knew why. <laughs>